brackish fish. Not a lot of people keep brackish fish. I've been actually been playing with brackish water and brackish tanks for probably about three years now and uh, a lot more recently over the last probably year and a half. And I want to share with you today the top five brackish fish that I think would be good for someone just getting into keeping brackish water tanks. Hey fish friends, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Zenzo from Tazawa Tanks. Now brackish water, for those of you that are not familiar with the brackish water, it's basically the realm between freshwater tanks and saltwater tanks. Brackish water is a mixture of fresh and salt water. I've made many videos about brackish water before, but if you're new to the channel or if this is just a video that's popping up on your feed, that's what brackish water is. Now in nature where you would find brackish water is where fresh water meets the ocean naturally, right? So we would be looking at um, rivers and streams that meet the ocean, estuaries. So that is an area where fresh water is flowing down from inland and it's mixing with the ocean water. And there's a lot of wildlife that lives in those areas from crustaceans to uh, mammals, uh, obviously uh, fish, um, reptiles, a lot of different plant life. And today I'm gonna talk about a few fish that are pretty common and some not so common that I think would be good for someone just getting into brackish water as these would be pretty easy to take care of with the proper care. Now some of the fish that we are going to leave out of this might be some good options for you. So these will be kind of the honorable mentions and the reason why I'm gonna keep them out is because I feel like they require a little bit more work or they require a larger aquarium. So in my mind, I'm thinking about people with smallish, medium to smaller tanks and being able to keep some of these fish and some of these other fish that will be honorable mentions might be a little bit too large. So some of those might be the archer fish. So there are some wonderful archer fish out there, but some of those can get quite large. So that would be one of the reasons why I would not suggest that for a beginner, uh, brackish water keeper. Um, also monos would be another uh, brackish water fish that uh, some people keep them in fresh water all the way to full marine or reef tanks. And, uh, but they do also do well in brackish water environments, but they can get pretty big and get like eight plus inches or so. So, and they're a little bit skittish, so not the easiest fish. Um, and then there's other fish like the Indian glass, uh, the glass fish. And also one of my favorites is the uh, blennies. So I have some top hat blennies, uh, very rare and probably not a beginner brackish water fish for most of you. So number five on my list is probably the most popular fish on this channel at this point. Well, one of them. Maybe it's probably the most popular brackish water fish on my channel, and that is the mud skipper. Now, there are two general types of mud skippers in the aquarium hobby. There's many, many species out there, but basically in the aquarium hobby, we see two types. We see the African mud skipper, which is what we have in this tank, which you can't see, but I'll get some B-roll of this tank right here. And then we have the Indian mud skippers, which are in that tank back there, which I'll take some B-roll of. The Indian mud skipper, unlike the African mud skipper, is easier to keep. For one, it's a lot smaller. The African mud skippers are big, so some of these um, easily seven inches or so, very thick, um, a lot more aggressive. So they do require more space. They can get quite large and they do have big appetites. So they wouldn't be great for some people because of the tank size, because of the aggression and also feeding them is a little bit more difficult. The Indian mudskippers on the other hand are small. So they stay really small, maybe three inches tops, pretty thin, like a, maybe like a pencil or like a Sharpie pen at the thickest. And, um, they are a little bit feisty with each other, but because they're so small, they don't really do any harm to each other. They don't really do any damage. So, um, and then you can keep more of them in a smaller tank because they're not as big. So you could keep some in a 20 gallon of cream as an example, or 20 long, a 29. I happen to keep them in a 40 gallon tank, but they do well in smaller tanks because they're not as large. They're also very easy to feed. So mine love the extreme curl flakes. So they'll eat flake food. They also love the extreme nano pellets, which are um, a little nano uh, pellet food, which they do love. They'll eat anything uh, frozen that I put in there, like blood worms, brine shrimp, uh, freeze dried foods, live foods. So very easy to feed, very fun to watch. They're kind of jump around and bicker with one another. They don't require a lot of space and they are a very fun fish to have. So that would be number five on the list. Number four on the list is puffers. The reason why I put puffers ahead of mudskippers is because they are more prevalent. Pretty much any local fish store that you go into is going to have 
puffers available, whether they have them in stock or they can very easily order them from the wholesaler or the transshipper. And there's a lot more known about the puffers than there are with the mudskippers. So that's why I put them a little bit higher up on the list at number four. Now the puffers that I have, I have two different types of puffers that do well in brackish water. One of those being the green spotted puffer, which I have down below in a 40 gallon uh, breeder tank. And then I also have a figure eight puffer that is housed with my African mudskippers. Both of the puffers uh, have very similar needs as far as the water parameters and they also have very similar diets so they like to have some meaty food so I'll feed them blood worms as an example I'll feed them freeze-dried uh, um, prawns or shrimp I'll feed them freeze-dried mealworms they'll eat a lot of snails and they do need some kind of harder food once in a while to keep their beak down because their beak is kind of like a it's a beak basically and it needs to get filed down from you know eating uh, harder foods and they can very easily crack through like Malaysian trumpet snail shells and things like that. So they do get a lot of snails as well. And they would be higher, but they are not the easiest fish to feed because you do need either live foods or some frozen foods or freeze dried foods. And they don't really do well with like pellets and flakes, even though I have kind of experimented a little bit before and I did get some to eat some pellets, but for the most part, they don't touch them. They go for the other stuff, but uh, very fun. There's a lot of uh, information out there. So if you do want to get a brackish water puffer, there's a lot of articles out there. There's a lot of um, people that have done a lot of work with them so that there's a lot of readily available information. I think that's very important to do or to have when you are getting into certain types of fish, especially if it's a new type of water that you're not familiar with. So puffers are number four on the list. Number three on the list is kind of similar to number five because they're in the same family and that's gobies. So gobies will span a lot of different fish. Um, the mudskippers are a type of goby. The ones that I would uh, recommend in particular are the bumblebee goby. The bumblebee goby is a really small goby that prefers brackish water, really fun coloration. So they basically have that bumblebee look where they're black and yellow, very distinct bars. They stay very small, less than an inch long, and uh, you can keep them in groups and not a lot of water. So you could keep a bunch of them like in a 10 gallon aquarium as an example, a 20 gallon aquarium, they would do very well. And uh, they also are very easy to feed. So mine will eat the pellet food, they'll eat the flake food, they'll eat the frozen um, blood worms and the brine shrimp, etc. So very easy to feed, not very large. Um, so you can keep them in a smaller tank, readily available. Now, a lot of people will get bumblebee gobies and they keep them in freshwater and they can be kept in freshwater. My experience and the research that I've done is that they do better with brackish water. And I'm not sure if it's a salinity or if it is the minerals that's in the water itself that makes them thrive and live a little bit longer, but uh, they can be kept in freshwater. But my recommendation would be, would be to have some salt in the system for that mineral content. Now I do have some other gobies in here. I've got some night gobies. Um, they are larger, they're more aggressive, they will eat other fish. So uh, that's why I didn't really add them to the list, but you could keep a night goby and those are also pretty common in the aquarium hobby. But definitely the bumblebee gobies would be the go-to goby for my recommendation. Number two on the list are mollies. Now recently I got these cellophane mollies and I put them in one of my brackish tanks. Mollies are a great fish that uh, are often kept in freshwater, but can go all the way to full salt. So you'll sometimes see them in people's aquariums that are reef tanks or marine tanks, and they do very well. In fact, they prefer to have some salinity. Um, so if you are gonna keep them in freshwater, I would advise to uh, keep them in a little bit higher pH with some crushed coral and some, uh, some minerals, etc. But mollies are a live bear, meaning they give birth to live fish. They are a wonderful, beautiful fish to keep in a brackish tank. They're readily available from your local fish store to the big box stores, the pet stores, pretty much any store that sells fish is gonna have these and uh, lots of different color variants, lots of different um, fin types. So you can uh, do like what I have with the sail fins, traditional mollies, all different kinds and just a fun fish. They can be a little bit aggressive, so definitely uh, you know, make sure that you're able to manage that and you don't have any other fish in there that might get bullied. But again, mollies would be a great number two fish. Number one on the list, probably going to catch you by surprise. That's guppies. That's right, guppies, probably the first fish that you kept or one of the first fish that you kept in your fish keeping hobby. Maybe you kind of look down at them thinking that they're just kind of like a kid's fish or a beginner fish. 
that is not true. They are fascinating, so many different color variants, and the fact that they are also a live bear makes them very easy to care for and very easy to reproduce as long as you have some cover, meaning some places for the babies to hide. A live bear means just that, that the fish give birth to live babies instead of laying eggs somewhere in the tank and having those eggs hatch. They give birth right to a live baby, as do the mollies that I uh, described in number two. Guppies, I think, are an excellent fish for people to get into brackish water because they will also thrive in fresh water. So you don't you know, need a lot of salt. Just adding a little bit of salt and kind of raising the salinity, learning about brackish water is a great way to kind of dip your toe into that realm. And guppies would be a great fish to do that. So very easy, obviously, to feed. They'll eat just about anything that they can fit in their mouth which is good and bad, depending if you wanna raise the babies or not. Um, they reproduce like guppies, so they're very, very easy to spawn and uh, get more of them. They've got excellent color variations and uh, they can live in a, you know, a bunch of different water environments, fresh water to brackish water. So I would recommend guppies as being number one on the list to learn about brackish water. Now I've actually taken guppies and put them in the mudskipper tank before. I've put them in um, the other, uh, the, the puffer tank before when I was cycling it and things like that. So they can be in full on brackish water very easily without a problem. Now before I go, I do want to talk a little bit about brackish water and salinity and about salt because I think this is a, an area where a lot of people get scared and hug up on it. So as far as salinity with brackish water, it's not that difficult because a brackish environment ranges from full fresh water at times when that river is flowing through and the tide is out and it's all fresh water to when the tide is in and maybe that river is low and it's pushing in a lot of salt into the system. There's a large variance as far as the salinity of water. So you don't have to be exact. A lot of people will send me messages in various formats asking me about salinity for their brackish tanks. And really, you can be kind of close because it doesn't really matter. I keep them like 1.005 up to 1.012 at times, um, which is a little bit on the salty side. But usually I'm like right around 1.006, 1.007, 1.008, 005. Anywhere in between and I don't really measure the salt anymore. Now I used to like measure the salt and do all the calculations and now as I'm doing water change, I kind of think about nature, you know, rivers fresh, you know, rushing through, pushing out the ocean, and then maybe the tide coming back. And so I just will refill and add salt. Now I used to pre-mix the salt water, and after a while I just kind of decided, nah, eh, it's just an extra step that I don't really need to take. So as I'm refilling, I will take some salt and uh, just kind of put it right where that water is pouring in, and it will mix and um, disperse and dissolve and uh, I will just get the results that I want. Now, one of the things that I do recommend is getting something that's called a refractometer. Um, you could use a hydrometer, which is very inexpensive, um, but I do like the refractometer a little bit better because it is more accurate and it's just fun to play with. And these are not as expensive as they used to be. And uh, basically, it's this little tool that you just put some water on, hold it up to some light, and then you can see like a blue line and it will tell you the salinity level, the specific gravity. And once you learn about mixing salt water and uh, fresh water and making your own brackish water, um, very easy to follow along. So uh, that is something that I would recommend. And then besides the other stuff that you would need as far as dechlorinators and all that kind of stuff, yes, you'll need all that kind of stuff, but you need salt. Now I happen to use a Fritz salt. This is the Reef Pro Mix. Um, this is a reef slash marine salt. Basically it's just a high quality salt. And uh, I like it just because I like the packaging. I like the fact that it mixes really well, meaning that uh, some salts don't dissolve as easily as other salts or they have like a lot of things in there that um, just make it not as easy to work with. And I found that the Fritz salt does dissolve very easily, very quickly. And it's saving me that extra step of having to pre-mix water where I would have to do that with some other salts that I've used in the past. Now, I am sponsored by Fritz, so I do want to just uh, put that disclaimer out there. Um, and it is a paid sponsorship, but um, this is an excellent product and I wouldn't be working with them if I didn't really believe in their products. And I wouldn't trust my rare fish 
some of them that are very hard to find, like by Blennies, if I didn't trust the salt. So excellent salt, but you can use any reef or marine salt to mix, but um, this is what I use in case you are interested. Now there's probably a whole bunch of other stuff that I didn't go over today, uh, trying to keep this video short-ish, and uh, there's so much that I could tell you about brackish water. I'm very passionate about it. I do have um, a lot of videos about brackish tanks and I'll put a link up above so that you can uh, check out some of the other videos that I've made over the last year and a half or so about brackish water. And uh, hopefully you guys uh, don't get scared of it. It's a great new area for you to uh, explore the aquarium hobby. Maybe you're someone that is thinking about getting into salt water and you want to think about a reef tank, but you're not quite ready to make that jump. Brackish would be a great transition to go from fresh water to brackish water. Because again, you don't have to be perfect. You'll learn about salt. You'll, le you'll learn about how to measure salinity. And uh, after you get your hang, after you get the hang of that and, and a feel for doing all of that, you might decide, you know, you just want to play with brackish water or you might want to get into reef, etc. Now, I will say... One last thing, brackish water is so cool because there are so many unique fish that you cannot get in the freshwater hobby. So uh, with that, uh, I just wanna say thanks for watching if you've made it this far. Hopefully you guys are all doing well during this uh, very trying time of having to uh, stay quarantined and uh, sheltering in place. I know it's not an easy thing to do. Um, I'm going crazy at times myself. Even though I've got this great fish room to hang out in, I go a little stir crazy, growing a beard. I'm doing some crazy stuff with my hair. That's bleach blonde right now, and I'm doing some crazy things. So uh, anyway, don't forget to like this video if you made it this far. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel if you have not done so already. Follow me on Instagram, which is Tazawa underscore tanks. Um, I'm on Twitter too, but I don't really tweet at all, ever, ever, ever. But if that's your thing, you can follow me on Twitter too. It's Tazawa underscore tanks. So uh, anyway, thanks for watching. Hopefully you're doing well. Comment down below your thoughts on brackish water. Catch you on the next one.